morning, voyagers. Let's get some action, some air in these lungs. Let's go. Aren't you alive today? Isn't Jesus alive in you today? Praise God. So I want to start off with a question just to make sure that Jesus is alive in us today. How many of us here would consider ourselves to be Bible-centered? I mean, I raised my hand there. Some people didn't raise their hand. I'm kind of scared. But the definition of Bible-centered is, do you allow God's word to be the source that provides guidance to your relationships and to your decision-making? And so I would hope that everyone here is in that boat. What makes me really sad is that Research shows that in 2019, this year, only 5% of Americans believe that to be about themselves. Only 5% of the people of this Christian nation would define themselves as Bible-centered. My friends and family, we got a problem. We've got a problem. I'm so grateful that Pac Rim has a mission to address this problem. Can we throw up the mission statement of Pac Rim? Because this is so important that we remember our mission Pacific Rim Christian University has a mission. I want all of us to say it together because we're one family in this mission together. All right, so make sure you're looking at it real clearly. Can you see it? We're going to start reading on three, two, one. Pack Rim exists to disciple emerging Christian leaders by developing theology, ministry skills, and character in order to win souls plant fruitful churches, and lead as exemplary ambassadors for Christ in the ministry and marketplace. I feel a change on the rise. Don't you feel it, guys? Don't you feel the change of people who are seeking to be disciple? People who are seeking to be filled with the wisdom that God has to lead not just our nation, but our world. And that's what we exist to do here. It's not something that we do. It's our existence. It's who we are. Who we are is this mission. And I'm so thankful that each and every one of you here, whether you're a student, a staff, or faculty, that you've jumped on board this great mission, this great voyage with Jesus. And we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead it, whether or not you're here with us just for two years, for four years, six years, maybe longer. But all we know is that in this season, right now, right here, God has got a plan for you, and he's working on you right here, right now, to prepare each and every one of you for what's next. But we're doing it here, right now. We're contending for the Holy Spirit to come and manifest God's presence in everything that we do now so that we'll be fully mature when we step into whatever it is that God has called for us. And whatever God has called you to do after this, we believe in that. We want to see you succeed in that. But part of that comes with, as we talk about being Bible-centered, are we allowing ourselves to let God guide our relationships? Are we allowing God to guide our decision-making, the things that we do? And so we have this great verse, maybe, hopefully it'll be the right one, but that is like the anchor for our ship here at Packham. Yeah, I think that might be it. But it's Isaiah 43, 2 through 7. But we're just going to read two. If you have it, great. If not, I have it right here. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. What God is reminding us is that though we will pass through dangerous things, overflowing rivers, trials of fire, that God himself is with us through it all. That we can face anything on this journey if we're with him, but also with each other. We're on a ship called Pacific Rim Christian University on this amazing voyage to see what God has in store for us. And like that scripture said, the storms will come and we'll rock the boat. But because God is in the boat with us, and we're in it together, we can get through it, amen? But, I hate to say this, but sometimes there's these other kinds of storms, not the kind of storms that come up for the word's sake, but the kind of storms that come up because uh, we might have made some decisions in our life, on our own, without seeking God's wisdom. 
And so I want you right now to look at the person next to you and say, it didn't have to happen this way. Okay, now turn to the other person that you forgot, your second choice, and tell them, I know, right? Like, it, didn't, it totally didn't have to happen this way. That's no, fine. It's okay. There are things in our lives <laughs> that really don't go according to God's plan sometimes. But I am so thankful that he is with us in it all. That he is working it all for good. That he interacts with us in the middle of whatever we're doing. In the middle of, of disobedience, in the middle of not seeking wisdom, he's with us. Like he actually allows us to demand this inheritance, this blessing from him, and walk away. He allows that. He allows us to sit in the pig pen and wallow in despair. But yet he's always with us in that. And the goodness of God is always chasing after us. That story of redemption is always chasing after us. That fatted calf is waiting for us. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I mean, not because I'm hungry, but because we have a God who never stops fighting for us. That's who he is. That's part of why we can accomplish this great mission for the world, because God's fighting for the same mission that we have here at Pac Rim. That we could step out into the world and represent God to a nation who is in obvious need of it. When we look at the state of our nation, there's so much division and depravity. And the solution is not better politicians and more social aid. The solution is more of God's will, more of God's wisdom. And we are uniquely positioned here to receive that wisdom if we can, if we can. Because we're all a family here on this ship. And I don't know if you've ever been on a ship, but if you're in a ship with me, I'm like the worst person to be around on a ship because I get super seasick very fast. Like I will turn white and green and barf everywhere and then be out of commission for the whole time. And so there are people like that on our ship that for no reason will get sick and barf on you and totally run away from you on this ship. You know, like there are times that we're not actually operating in this loving family, but out of whatever's going on in our flesh, it just comes out. And so instead of co-laboring with Christ and each other to accomplish the mission on this voyage together, sometimes we're actually just doing what's best for ourselves. You know, I hate to admit it because I'm a prideful person too. I think we all sometimes end up in that place where we want something for ourselves. And we believe that God has, has granted that to us. And so we feel since he said it will happen, that I should just help him make it happen, you know? Like he needs help making it happen. But when we place our own desires and our own needs, our own wants as the reason for our relationships and our decision-making, we're removing God from that equation. And we're putting ourselves as the source. And when that happens, destruction usually follows. Mirroring what's going on in our nation and the world those, those same issues exist in the church. There's divisiveness in the church. There's divisiveness in this family. There are things that happen that because of our own desires and our own pride, sometimes it leads us to not co-labor on the ship well together. And let me tell you, the ship, the storms that come is going to rock the boat enough. I don't think we really need to do it ourselves, but that's what family does sometimes, right? Like, I don't know about you guys, but my parents, man, I knew so much better than them. <laughs> so much better. So much better than them. You know, maybe only once or twice, but I usually felt like it more than that. But you know how it works, right? When we have someone who's older and wiser and who might have been through so much more in our lives, like our parents or older siblings, it's always the same story, right? Like, man... What are you talking about? You don't know what I'm going through. You're old, man. Like that was, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. But you don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm going through. I'm just going to figure it out myself. And, you know, that's the story of a lot of my life. And I ended up on this ship with you guys. So I praise God for that. I praise God that God worked it out for my good. But look, even on this ship together, as a bunch of people who God is continuing to work good through, we still need to contend for God's wisdom. We still need to contend for this relationalness that God has called us to be. 
And so in the mission statement, it's very important that there are these two words that says, Pakram exists and then to do something. And everything else follows that. So if we do this something that is there in the mission statement, everything else will follow. Your theology will follow, your character will follow, your ministry skills will follow. If we do this something, if we are doing this something and it is to disciple, are we discipling and are we allowing ourselves to be disciple? You see, God's wisdom is that he's placed you in a community with people, staff, faculty, graduate students, upperclassmen, who, while we may not understand you and your story perfectly, have been through storms of life, just like you've been. And whatever storm that you're in, or that you're coming out of, whatever feels like death to you, whatever feels like it's the end, let me tell you, God has shown up in all of our lives so mightily that the things that you think is an end, God has showed us it's a new beginning in our lives. The things that was burnt to the ground, God rose from the ashes in our lives. <laughs> Things that were pronounced dead by the world, God had breathed life back into it. And it is our honor to share that with you, to share our very lives with you, that it's not just about discipling professionally as staff and faculty, but like Jesus showed us, it's a personal discipleship. Would you allow us to enter into this personal discipleship with you? Would you allow the staff and faculty to see the gunk on your feet and wash your feet? I know it's really hard. I know because I wear shoes all the time, so my feet's pretty clean, and I don't want no one to see my feet. But could you imagine what our world would look like if we allowed these kind of things to happen? The change is on the rise not because of just a beautiful song and beautiful singing and talented people. But change is on the rise because God's spirit is with us. And are we contending for that, though? Or are we allowing pride to sink in and divide us? I don't know about you, but I feel like there might be a story in the Bible that might shed some light into this. And if you guys have your Bible app, it's kind of a, it might be a little bit of a long reading, so you can open it up to help you out to keep track with what we're doing, but it's in Acts 27. We have a brother, Paul. He's on this voyage, kind of like we are now, and he's in the midst of this journey that God has called him to be on right now. He's on the way to Rome because God told him he's going to speak in Rome. Way back in Acts 23, so we're in the middle of this story about Paul, and something happens in this story that can help illuminate something about seeking God's wisdom in our voyage. So starting in Acts 27, verse 4, from there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed in Myra in Lycia. So you got to come back him so you can say all these words. <laughs> there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snedis. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmon, and we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Bear Havens, near the town of Lacea. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men and women, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. And so in this story right now, they're seeing signs of opposition in the journey. Things aren't going according to their plan, to their timing. The winds weren't with them, and they lost what we would call a safe time to accomplish this plan. And everyone knew this. Everyone who was on that boat knew that this time of year was not the best time to go sailing. And so Paul was imploring them, speaking to the wisdom they already had but the sailors reject the wisdom they already had and also Paul's timely advice in this moment. They saw the situation they were in and they just didn't want to be there. 
They push the hand against their own wisdom and Paul's wisdom. And if we're being honest, sometimes we do the same thing in our lives. When we're in this moment where we feel like things are happening the way we want, when we want, we decide to push ahead. Or we look for signs for God to help us show that he's on board with our plan and our time instead. Instead of seeking God's wisdom in this situation, they relied on their own wisdom and they just kept going. And so the very next verse, verse 13 When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore to Crete. I wonder how many times we look to the wind instead of looking to God for answers. We're looking to the wind for favor, but are we looking to the spirit that pushes that wind for the favor? You know, sometimes it looks like this. Like God promised me that I would be a pastor or a ministry leader. So he sent me to a Christian university so that I could work on my theology, ministry skills and character. And then all of a sudden, a wind starts to blow. And after the first year, an opportunity arises to do just that, to be a pastor or ministry leader. The wind may be blowing, but do we stop and seek God's wisdom in that decision? Do we stop? and seek wise counsel? Do we stop and consider whether or not the maturity that God has called us to receive at that Christian university has taken place? Have we learned the ministry skills and the theology and has our character grown into that spot where it's necessary that we can carry that blessing? Because the world needs us to be fully mature pastors and ministry leaders. Or it might look something like this. Like maybe someone gave me a prophecy over a relationship or a marriage to be. And so since this is already going to come to pass, I should start making things happen. If I'm single, I should start looking for something. I should be ready to mingle because God said so. Or if I'm in a relationship already, it might be okay to do things that the world said is okay. But just because the wind is blowing toward the end of marriage, are we looking to God for wisdom? Are we looking to God to show us that through our relationship, we're actually ministering to the world? They were demonstrating proper theology and proper skills in ministry and also Christian character in the way that we interact in our relationships. Like I said at the beginning, are we Bible-centered people who are allowing God to be the ones to determine how we manage our relationships and our decisions? Are we really seeking God's wisdom together as a family? Are we allowing us to disciple each other? And so we look at what Paul was doing in this moment. I don't know what he was doing. He was silent. But I tell you what he didn't do. He didn't start mansplaining what they should do in this situation. He didn't start judging them. He didn't abandon ship. He remained silent yet patient. And I believe he was waiting for God to do something. He was waiting for God to move first because God is always with us on these decisions that we make. So just remember, as you look around, there's staff and faculty and upperclassmen who are with you in this journey, who sometimes we might be silent. We're encouraging you in prayer. We're trying to strive. We're trying to reach out to you sometimes. We want what God's best for your life is. We really do. Because we believe that's why you're here. Because God's preparing you for something even greater. The glory that is yet to be seen in your journey here at Pacram will lead you into that future glory that you're waiting for. If we can be patient, if we ultimately allow God to remain in control. So let's continue in the story and see what happens. In verse 14, They got that nice win, and so they went ahead. And let's see what happens here. Verse 14, before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Nor'easter swept down from the island, and the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. And as we passed to the lee on the small island called Kauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid 
they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day we began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither star, sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So sometimes when we push ahead with these decisions, major storms show up in our lives. The kind that actually threatens to sink the ship that we believe that we're on. And we start to freak out like these guys. We start to do everything that we can in our own strength and our own wisdom to try and save the ship. But as we read, the sailors eventually reached the end of their hope in themselves. And amazingly, this is when God re-enters into this story. Verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And so part of God's wisdom is understanding that he has a plan for every promise. That while we might make unwise decisions, God is still with us and he surrounds us with people like Paul in this story to intercede for him on our behalf. We all need people to demonstrate what Paul is demonstrating in this moment with us. Sure, Paul warned them before the journey began and he told them danger was ahead, but Paul remained patient and Paul allowed God to remain in control. In the middle of the storm, Paul was still waiting on God to make the first move. He could have done what he heard Jesus did. He could have started taking a nap in the storm. He could have started singing in the middle of the storm. He totally could have. He could have stood up and rebuked the storm. He had every right and every authority to do those things. But see, what made Paul so special in this moment, what I hope the message is that we should get in all this is that in the middle of the storm, in the middle of whatever we're facing, we can still seek God's wisdom first. We don't need to just act by what we've seen other people do or heard other people do. We can go seek our king for the answer. So Paul waited and put his hope and trust in God. And I hope that that is what we can do as well. As we journey together, that we continue to place our hope and trust in God's wisdom and allow him to tell us and direct our steps. Because once that happens, we enter what we're all seeking for, I believe, which is God's rest. In this place, we're no longer worried about saving our ship or saving our lives, but we're believing that God is in charge. And if, let me tell you, he can and he will do all things. And the amazing thing about this is that even though they're going to be shipwrecked, it's not the end of God's story in their lives. And even though there will be times that we'll be shipwrecked together, family, I tell you what, that's not the story of God's. God's story is not over in our lives either, amen? That God, even if we crash the ship, even if some of us may lose our lives. God is faithful and just to forgive, and he will bring every dead thing back to life to accomplish his will in Jesus' name. I believe that firmly for each of us, whatever it is that we think God is not doing, trust me, he's doing something. But are we contending to see what he's actually doing? Can we be patient? Can we be persistent in seeking after God's wisdom? Because just because a relationship may fail, just because my grades may fail, just because a dream or an opportunity may pass, what God has already spoken over your life will always come to pass. There is nothing that can stop it from coming to pass. The gates of hell will not prevail because our king, as we sung earlier, he's won the victory over death. 
cannot be stopped. But just because it can't be stopped doesn't mean we need to make it more dramatic and more exciting, you know, to make it a more cool story in the end. Today, as one family under God, indivisible, can we humble ourselves and allow God's voice to again be the center of our hearts, the center of our relationships, the center of our decision making? And can we as staff and faculty and students humble ourselves so that we can disciple each other? Can we have these one-on-one -on -one conversations where we're sharing and witnessing to what God has already done in our lives so it may encourage you as you walk through those things or will walk through those things in the future? And guess what? You guys are also discipling us back. We're learning just as much as we're giving because that is what community is all about. That's what family is all about. We don't know any more than anybody else. We haven't achieved anything. We're all just on this journey together, seeking to continue to be discipled by God. <laughs>